morning. Good morning. morning. Is my mic on? Can you hear me good? No? Okay. We'll use this. Hello. Good morning. So um, I'm David Bonnerchuk, owner of Scratch Catering Services here in Denver, Colorado. And uh, the library and RJ from Creative Mornings um, uh, approached me about uh, giving a speech on reality. So um, what is reality? Uh, my reality um, to you all will be just a story. And at the end of this, you'll say, thank you so much for sharing your story. But to me, it's not really a story. However, it is kind of like a modern day Cinderella. <laughs> Although I don't have the gown, not today. <laughs> so um, it, it all really kind of started for me when I was uh, 16 and I was um, living with my dad. You see, my um, mom had moved to California with my stepdad and my sister and I stayed in Denver. Um, I'm a fourth generation native, and my grandfather had just been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the blood. Actually, it's the same kind of cancer that Sam Walton of the famous Walmart franchise uh, passed away with. And so the um, family of uh, the Waltons set up a hospital at Little Rock, Arkansas, um, at the university there to study this type of cancer. So my grandfather would travel from Denver to Little Rock and received treatments for his cancer. And when my mom moved away, my grandparents really needed some help. And so I stayed to um, help them out. Um, I couldn't live with them. They had a one bedroom home and they were kind of coming and going. And so I moved schools and I moved in with my real father. Um, my real father is um, uh, an alcoholic and very abusive, which is the reason my, grandma, my mother and my father originally um, had separated so many years ago. But I figured that maybe he had gotten better or um, that I was bigger and that the abuse would not continue. So I went ahead and moved in with my real father and uh, was here to help my grandparents. But um, the abuse continued and it got really bad. And I was picked on at school, my new school. People would make fun of me. I was kind of different than everybody else. Um, you know, who's this gay kid coming, you know? And so I wasn't really accepted. And so I started showing up at school with marks on me. And at first I would just say, well, you know, I got beat up after school, you know, bullies and things like that. And then it got even worse. And I wasn't able to kind of explain what had really transpired um, because anybody who's like a victim of abuse, there's um, a certain amount of shame that goes along with it. You don't want to admit that this is what's happening to you. You don't want to uh, tell the world that you know, you're living with this and allowing this. And so I just kept quiet. And so, um, and I mean, that's kind of reality though, you know, for me. And so um, I stopped going to school because I didn't want people asking me questions. I was abused at home and then I'd go to school and I was abused. And I kind of felt like there wasn't any resource for me to, you know, really protect myself or anyone really to talk to. I felt very alone. And so I stopped going to school and um, I started hanging out at, at the house. And uh, one night my dad went into one of his tirades and he pulled a gun on me and fired two shots in the house. I barricaded myself in the bedroom with the dresser and the door against the, the um, the dresser in the bed against the door. And um, by the time I got outside the window, the police were at the house. And um, this was just one of a lot of instances that had occurred. And you know, whenever I tell this story, it's really kind of upsetting to my family. Not my dad, because I don't really have you know, contact with him anymore. But um, since we're talking about reality, when I tell my story, I don't really go into depth about the abuse and the, the, all of the circumstances that, you know, led me to ultimately where I'm getting to is the homeless shelter. Because um, my family either feels guilt or they don't really kind of understand really everything that I was going through at that time because I wasn't really ready to be like, I'm, I'm gay, I'm, I'm here, you know? And so I wasn't ready to come out and say all of these things, and they didn't really understand everything that was going on. And now looking back, they see like, well, it was so simple, but it really wasn't. And so my dad that evening was arrested, 
And this happened to be the time that my grandparents were gone. They had been down in Arkansas getting treatment for my grandfather's cancer. And so the police, they said to me, they said, do you have another family that we can drop you off of? Can you go to, you know, where can we take you? You can't stay here. And I said, well, my grandparents are gone. Um, and they said, well, you either can go into foster care and, and, and wait there for them to come back, or we can drop you off at this teen homeless shelter. And so I went ahead and went to the shelter because then I could continue working. At that time, I had a job. And so I went to the homeless shelter, and that's where I stayed. I thought I would only be there for a couple of weeks. Typically, my grandfather went down to Arkansas and got treatments and was back. Um, but during this time, he had received a port in his chest that was delivering doses of chemotherapy to his body at the right times or whatever. And he didn't have to travel to get the, the chemo. It was just automatically happening through this port in his chest. Well, there was a malfunction in this port, and it burst. And so he almost died because he had all of this radiation go into his system at once. And so instead of being gone for three weeks, my grandfather was gone down there for eight months. And so there I was in the homeless shelter. And it really kind of happened out of circumstance. It wasn't a choice that I had made or anything like that. Sometimes when people hear my story, they think, oh, well, he must have done something you know, to deserve this. But he's really turned his life around. Good for you. <laughs> That's not the story. But there were a lot of people at the shelter that you know, did probably make bad decisions. While I was there, there were people, during the day, you're not allowed to stay in the homeless shelter. During the day, you have to go out and either go to school, get a job, be a contributor to society. People were involved with gangs. People were selling their bodies in prostitution. People were selling drugs. And I didn't want to be that person. Every day, they, after breakfast, we would have oatmeal, I remember, and uh, they would give us bus tokens. And with those bus tokens, I, I, oh, by the way, I was staying off of uh, Colfax and Sims in the old Gemini shelter. That's where I was, if, if some of you are familiar with the area. And they give me bus tokens. And so I walked down to Colfax, and I caught the Colfax bus. And I wasn't in school, so I rode the Colfax bus to Broadway, where here's the library. This is where it all started. All of my life story and everything you're about to hear, this is where it started. And I walked into this building, the library, and I started reading books. Because reading books was like escapism for me. You know, I didn't have to deal with the problems of my family and my abuse and me being homeless and not in school and all of this. I could, uh, you know, completely escape and read and dive into a book. One day I returned to the shelter and it was really cold and it was snowing outside and we were allowed, I think we were allowed to come back at like four o'clock. And we were entering the shelter and they had us all come inside and inside there was a television. And on that television there was a program going on, it was the holidays, and um, there was this woman and she was at the White House. And she was decorating with the first lady, and she went from room to room. She was making gingerbread homes and wreaths, and she was doing all of these wonderful things. And I thought to myself, who is this woman? She does everything. And in that moment, I realized that if I wanted to be somebody, and I wanted to go somewhere, that no one was going to come knocking on that shelter door to say, hey, here, here you go, here's an opportunity. We're giving you a job or whatever. No, if I wanted to live a beautiful life, if I wanted to you know, be a step above where I was now, I had to work and I had to do it just like this woman who was doing it herself. And so the next day I got my bus tokens and I came to the library and I, and I started researching this woman and I, I remember I, I, I went to the service desk and I was like, okay, so like I saw this woman, and she's like decorating the White House, and she's doing all these things. And the service person's like, do you have a name? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't know her name, but like I'm sure there's like a video or a book or a something about this woman. She's amazing. So we, she, the the reference person didn't know who I was talking about. So we went to the computer, and they had computers we could use to access internet and stuff. And um, sure enough. 
The woman was Martha Stewart. <laughs> she was all over this library. She did gardening and baking and decorating and cooking and she built a house, several houses. She even had her own line at Kmart. She sold pots and pans with her name and face on them. I'm Martha Stewart. <laughs> so I started reading her books cover to cover because if I was going to be somebody, this woman was going to show me how to do it. After all, she built her house. <coughs> she owned chickens. <laughs> so I started reading her books cover to cover. And in her books, sometimes she would reference other chefs. So I was like, oh, well, who's Bobby Flay? Research Bobby Flay. What does he cook? Oh, who's Rick Bayless? Oh, got to research him. And so I was all over this library, and it was like a new world had all of a sudden opened up for me. I wasn't reading People magazine, you know, finding out about Brad Pitt. This was pre-Kardashian, I should say. <laughs> okay. And uh, I started reading cookbooks. So a childhood friend of mine um, had come looking for me, and I had uh, left notes with all of my neighbors telling them where I was in this homeless shelter. And so... He came looking for me because he had made a girl pregnant and his family was requiring that he make right and marry this girl. So we had had this childhood pact that if we ever got married, we'd be each other's best man. So he came looking for me. My grandparents still weren't back. And so my neighbor of my grandparents told him where I was and he came looking for me at the shelter. But the rules of the shelter, HIPAA laws and all this, whatever, they weren't allowed to tell him that I was there. They could only just take a message. So when I got back to the shelter that evening, someone had told me that someone was looking for me and gave me the name. Well, I, I was allowed to use the phone, and I called him, and he came and picked me up. He took me up to Greeley, conservative Greeley of all places. I was already picked on down in Denver. Can you imagine what Greeley awaited for me? So I get to Greeley, and his family staunch Baptists, they said, we'd like you to come live with us on two rules. You go back to school and you get a job. I said yes. I went back to school and I got a job at the local McDonald's. Culinary McDonald's. <laughs> this was la gourmet a la beef. Okay. So I started working at McDonald's. I finished school and uh, got back into church and um, Pretty soon, of course, my grandparents came back and found out everything that was going on. But by, at, at this time, had, by this time had passed, I was already back into school and established. And I went from being the most picked on kid in school to the most popular kid in Greeley just because I was being myself. I, at that point, I had nothing else to lose. And so when people would say, hey, are you gay? What's up with you, faggot? They're like, yeah, and what? And they backed off. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, well, we got somebody that's not afraid to tell us what's what. And so I went from being the most picked on to they, prom, they crowned me prom king. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so after high school, I moved back to Denver. And I still came to the Denver Public Library. My very first apartment was over off of 20th and Curtis. And I still came to the library checking out books every day. And whenever I had extra money for ingredients, I'd buy a new spice, I'd try new recipes. In my tiny little studio apartment, I'm trying to bake and all of this. And so pretty soon, I would take my baked goods to neighbors, people at work, church, family members. And they were like, hey, this is pretty good. Well, after practicing and doing all of these things for so long, I got quite a repertoire of recipes and ideas and learned different techniques. So I was starting to incorporate my own creativity into my cooking and my baking. And so people started asking me. They're like, hey, I'm, I'm getting married. Can you make me 200 cupcakes? Hey, I'm going to my family's for Christmas. Can I get some cookies? I was known for my baking back in the day because baking was easier to carry than, like, I don't know, a tray of lasagna. <laughs> so people would ask me for my baking, and so Scratch Catering Services was born. I finally got tired of baking for free for just the cost of ingredients, staying up all night sleeping over cupcakes. Because this isn't Duncan Hines, y'all. I did from scratch. <laughs> Hence, Scratch Catering Services on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> Follow me, friend me, love me, like me. <laughs> so Scratch Catering Services was born. 
So at that point, I had started my business. I started taking pictures of my event. This, this was kind of before social media explosion and all that, whatever. So I took pictures of my events, my food, and my dis table displays. And I said to myself, you know what? I finally know that I had made it. If I get to go decorate the White House, just like I saw that in Martha Stewart. <laughs> so I started sending letters and photos to the White House, starting with Laura Bush. I never heard anything from that lady. <laughs> she was Republican. <laughs> I kept it up, kept it up, kept it up, and finally, I got a letter in 2011 from Michelle Obama, and, and when I got the, the letter, I, I get it, and I'm thinking, okay, they are sick of the letters, they are sick of the photos, this is Secret Service, they're like telling me to cease and desist, we don't want you. We got professionals. <laughs> But it was actually a letter inviting me to come decorate for the holiday season. <laughs> and when I opened that letter, I literally, I still get like choked up about it because it was that moment for me when I was like, they want me? Really? They want me? So that first year, I, de I was lead decorator in the Red Room of the White House. And they loved what I had done so much that they invited me back to also do the Green Room that year. So the red room and the green room is upstairs of the White House. If you've ever gone on a White House tour, you kind of enter into the visitor center in the basement, you go down the hallway corridor, booksellers, there's the China room down there, the diplomat room. Then they take you upstairs where they have the state dining room, the red room, the green room, the blue room where they usually put that big tree, um, and then the east room where they kind of, uh, you know, host all of the press conferences and big parties there at the White House. So the red room has fabric for walls. It's amazing. And so I was decorating this room. And so I was able to select the colors and things that I wanted in that room. I pulled different boxes and things. I didn't want red on red. I kind of went off of you know tapestries and, and kind of accents in the room to adorn my trees. And they loved what I had done so much that I thought I was done. But they called me back to the White House to decorate the green room. When I was decorating the green room, see, the first lady, and the, the White House probably isn't going to like that I talk about this, but the first lady is all about, like, get fit, eat right, all this, whatever. <laughs> well, the uh, floral decorator at the White House had decided to decorate the green room that year, which was kind of like recycle, reuse, renew. That's kind of the theme of the green room decor every year. She had used old Coke cans to make these big, huge boxwoods for in front of the windows and things. So it wasn't even real Christmas trees. They were these giant boxwoods made out of recycled pop cans. And so the night before the press preview, the you know first lady and her team and everybody comes through and they're like, you know, the press is coming tomorrow and you're all about get fit, eat right. What are they going to say about Coca-Cola cans in the White House? <laughs> So they called me back to decorate different trees, and they pulled those. So I'm like literally glittering pine cones while the press is downstairs. <laughs> so I finished decorating the trees, and here comes the uh, press secretary, the first lady, into the White House. She's like, the press is coming. The press is coming. Get ready. And so I'm thinking while I'm getting ready in the green room to speak to the press, I'm thinking they're going to say, well, what did you do about the, um, what, how did you do the decor? So the lady's like, no pop cans. No mention. Don't mention pop cans. So I'm like freaked out. I'm like, oh my gosh. So the press comes and they ask me, they say, well, what brought you to the White House? They didn't care about all my decor and all of this, whatever. They wanted to know about me. I said, well, me? I said, well, when I was 16, I was homeless. And I saw Martha Stewart on the TV with then First Lady Hillary Clinton. And I said, now that's something I want to do. Look out, Martha Stewart. Here I am. <laughs> so they aired my story on CNN, MS, MSN, NBC, and all of these different news outlets. And so I returned to Denver, and I, at that point I was still running my catering company in tandem with working at the fast food restaurant. So I'm standing in the drive-through <laughs> after I had just returned from decorating the White House. <laughs> right? And I've got some lady over here yelling about barbecue sauce, and meanwhile there's a ring on my phone. And on the phone it said, 
it was the White House calling, because I had programmed him into my phone. <laughs> and they always call from the same over 212. I'm not going to finish it, but I still have it in my phone. <laughs> and I answered the phone, and it was the press secretary to the first lady. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they can't know I'm at the McDonald's. <laughs> so I'm like trying to take this call. Meanwhile, my manager is like, get off the phone, it's lunch rush. What can a lady want? I'm like, she wants barbecue sauce. This is the White House calling me. <laughs> so I answer the phone, and it's the press secretary to the first lady. And Hannah August says to me, she said, oh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen that uh, video from the uh, correspondence dinner, but Hannah August is the DMV lady in the most recent yeah. video, if you've seen that funny video. Yeah. So anyhow, so she calls me on the phone, and she says, hey, David, are you busy? And I said, Got buzzers going on, fries going down, barbecue sauce lady. And so I'm like, oh no, I'm fine, what's up? And so she says, well, we wanted to get your permission to pass on your contact information. And I said, well, sure, who wants to talk to me? And so she says, she says, Martha Stewart. I was stand, I was just dumbfounded. I think I, at that moment I started crying in the drive-thru. And the, of course the barbecue sauce lady thinks that I need Prozac or something. And so after all that was said and done, I got to go meet Martha Stewart. And so this is what happened. From our studios in New York City, it's the Martha Stewart Show. Well, someone that uh, is very special to you sent you a message. Oh. You want to hear? I would love it. Okay, here it is. Hi, David. I, I just want to thank you again for volunteering with us at the White House. You should know that your time and talent helped to create a wonderful lifetime memory for tens of thousands of our visitors. But more than anything, I want to thank you for sharing your inspiring story. You are proof that if we keep our dreams in our sights, if we work hard enough, if we weather the bumps that are sure to come along the way, then we can achieve anything we set our minds to. And that is a beautiful gift for all of us this holiday season. So thanks again. Isn't that nice? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is amazing. It's amazing. So now you have a, an added memory to take home with you. Absolutely. Martha, this <laughs> is officially the best <laughs> Christmas ever. <laughs> It never gets old. So after that, I, I thought I had hit the big time. So I returned home and I continued catering because that was really my love, is meeting people, connecting with people. And uh, then of course, I was on Martha Stewart. So everyone wanted to hear my story. How, how is Martha Stewart for real? <laughs> She's very kind, she's very loving, and I love her. So that's what I have to say about Ms. Martha Stewart. So I returned back to Denver, and um, I continued working. So these are some slides for me. So after I was working at the White House, um, I started doing weekly uh, cooking segments on the local Nine News. This is uh, me in the White House. Actually, I was invited back in 2012 again for a second time, and that was when I decorated the East Room. This is me at the library. <laughs> and these are some of my events. I always try to make it more, more fabulous. This is me in 2012 in the Blue Room at the White House. And so now I cater cocktail parties, weddings, um, everything. And I'm kind of known for my baking, because after all, that is kind of how it started. But I incorporated food, actually, into my menus as well. Um, but I am known for my baking. And in 2014, I was contacted by Food Network to uh, be in the Holiday Baking Championship with Bobby Dean. This is me and some of the cast. And uh, this is a little bit of that show. This is the Holiday Baking Championship. Host Bobby Dean. I have a little gift for you right here, right now. OMG! We'll be <laughs> professional and all bakers to intense challenges. Your job is to reinvent fruitcake. Flipping kidding me. This is crazy to do. It's gingerbread time. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is freaking bomb. Which of you can impress the judges? Nancy Fuller. Yummy, yummy to my tummy, tummy. Ralph Goldman. You are here by the skin of your teeth. And Lorraine Pascal. It is a superb plate of food. In the end, the best holiday baker will rise to claim the $50,000 prize. Woo! Oh my goodness. And the right to be called... Rock and roll, dude. The holiday baking champion. During that show, I won best pie in America, by the way. <laughs> so I returned from doing a uh, food network, and I still do amazing events. And um, I'm no longer on Nine News because of my um, uh, contract agreement with Scripps Network, with Food Network. But I am on um, the local Channel 2 and Channel 31, basically almost weekly, doing uh, weekly spots, teaching people how to cook. Because at this point, okay, I got to meet Martha, I got to go to the White House, but then where do you take that? You know, it's kind of time to start giving back. And so now I want to teach, and now I want to inspire people who may be looking for inspiration, people who may be just needing that extra, you know, um, glimmer of hope. And so now I'm on the local <coughs> networks, and I have some clips from that as well. We're going to take some uh, white onion and just put it in the base of the slow cooker. Okay. Take your boneless beef roast. That is a nice piece of meat you got there, buddy. Right? <laughs> and if you have any gaps between the raspberries, go ahead and add a few whole pistachios. Tracy, are you ready to shop? Yes, let's, let's go. Let's do it. Hello there. I need a pound of ground pork. So I've added the dressing here to this lettuce, and we're going to just go ahead and put this right on the sandwich. Ah, oh, brilliant! This is um, my peach bellini, mm -hmm. and right in the bottom of this uh, fluke here, I've got some pureed peaches. If you need, you taste your peaches before you puree them. If you need to add sugar, add sugar. If they're sweet enough, then don't. Okay. First, what we're going to do is we're going to mix the meat mixture. This is ground pork, which you get fresh, uh -huh. and these are all the ingredients. Let's start with this blue grain meringue, and then to gild the lily, we're going to go ahead and fire up the torch. Woo! <laughs> and you just want to toast. See how quickly that goes? That's beautiful. So that's me on local TV. <laughs> so, again, like me on Instagram, like me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook. <laughs> All right, and so, um, I love telling my story because I don't really want pity or any of that about all of that happens. You know, bad things happen. You know, we, we see what happens with when Beyonce gets lemons, you know? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes bad things happen to you and you just gotta make the best of them. You know, I didn't make an album, I'm writing a cookbook. So, um, thank you so much for being so welcoming and loving today.